Hello and welcome to today's CE Pro webinar entitled From Ordinary to Extraordinary, The Art and Science of Landscape Lighting Design. I'm Jason Knott, editor of CE Pro, and I am excited to be moderating today's webcast. You know, landscape lighting has quickly become a growth category for so many integrators. In fact, I don't know if you saw the article recently on CE Pro. It was a by um, research from the National Association of Realtors that cited landscape lighting as the number one most impactful outdoor improvement that a homeowner can do to their home to add value. It actually tied with in-ground swimming pools, but was way ahead of things like patio upgrades and even lawn maintenance and tree trimming. So it shows you how important this category can be to the customer base out there. CE Pro had some data uh, that showed that integrators did a median of eight outdoor projects last year, but only two of those included any form of light outdoor lighting. So that could have been security motion sensor lighting or landscape lighting. The point being that there is a lot of growth, potential growth in this category for integrators. So um, that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we are going to have a great webinar that focuses on uh, landscape lighting design and the category. And um, uh, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And uh, I want to jump right into it. But first, I have a couple of housekeeping slides I want to run through. Hopefully, uh, you are hearing me um, okay today. Um, if you're not, uh, then please check uh, to make sure that your computer is not muted. This is a streaming uh, webinar, so hopefully my audio is coming through. I was actually having a little bit of glitching um, on, on my end, so hopefully you're hearing me okay. You can hit the test my system button using the, the question mark in the upper right-hand corner of the Global Meet interface. And if you're having any problems, sometimes just disconnecting and reconnecting will improve the stream. Um, also, this is uh, interactive. We want to hear questions from you. So we're going to have time at the end to have questions from you. So there's a, a box on the left side of your screen that says ask a question. You can ask your questions then. I will recommend you ask them as you think of them. Don't wait till the very end. But if they come to mind throughout the presentation, go ahead and type those in. I'm going to be scanning those throughout the presentation and looking for ones uh, to answer. Hopefully we can get to all the questions that are going to be asked. I'm going to answer the first question that I know is going to be in there, which is, um, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes. The session is being recorded and it is going to be up on uh, CE Pro uh, website within the next 24 hours. Um, I want to thank Garden Light LED for sponsoring today's webcast. Without support from partners like Garden Light LED, we couldn't bring you great educational uh, events like this. So thank you very, very much to Garden Light LED. All right. Um, let me introduce who is going to be um, giving all the information today. First with me is uh, Michelle Mueller, who is the co-founder of Garden Light LED. They're a leading manufacturer in the landscape lighting space for over three decades. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jan. Hi. Thanks Hello, for joining me today. Also hey. with us today is Janet Lennox Moyer. Uh, Janet is the. <laughs> Also with us today is Janet Lennox Moyer. Janet is the, the leading uh, preeminent landscape lighting designer in the industry, uh, most certainly. She is an accomplished author and she has her own uh, lighting design firm that is uh, part, and she's part of the prestigious International Association of Lighting Designers. Welcome, Jan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my pleasure. All right, let's uh, let's jump right into it. Again, ask those questions as you think of them. Um, uh, we're going to be scanning those. And I know you're going to get a lot of value out of this, and you're going to learn how important lighting design is. So, uh, without any further ado, I want to throw it over to Michelle. Michelle, take it away. Hello. Okay, Jason. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here today. We're Really honored and excited to have this opportunity to share a little bit more about who we are and uh, the opportunities that are available to you as a entrepreneur and business owner in the um, in the AV space. 
Um, we do appreciate everything that you guys are doing for us as well, Jason and Jan. Thank you for joining us. I am Michelle Mueller, co-founder of Garden Light LED. Um, it's hard to say that I've been doing this for almost 23 years. I cannot believe it. I've dedicated my life to Garden Light um, and all the people that are in this building. And uh, it's just an honor for me to be here to represent and to kind of share with you a little bit more about our company and the vision and why we would like to work with you. So um, just right out of the gate, I'd like to share our vision and mission statement. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've had an evolution of our vision and mission and it always comes down to the people. Everything that we do um, is about our people internally and externally. And we have a vision that is to illuminate humankind. It's a very big vision. But of course, when you're in the landscape lighting business and with what we do and what we've built with our partners for almost three decades, um, it does build financial freedom, which is you know, why it's our purpose to get up and go to work. If a lot of us didn't have to work, I'm sure um, you, know, you can only vacation so much. But since 1996, Garden Light LED has empowered hundreds of entrepreneurs to achieve financial freedom and fulfill their dreams by owning and building successful businesses. These landscape lighting businesses or AV companies support families and communities by empowering hundreds of individuals throughout the United States and other countries. So again, you know, actually it's more about thousands uh, with all the people that we've had the privilege to work for and hearing the success stories that are out there um, and even just internally with what we do here, seeing people that, you know, we're riding bikes or buses to work, uh, actually having a sustainable career, nothing brings us more joy and it's through lighting. And it's such, been such a pleasure to have that opportunity to serve. Um, I just briefly wanted to touch on the benefits of partnering with a manufacturer. Uh, Garden Light LED is heavily invested in our people, our partners, our products, and education. Um, I will also say that landscape lighting has been such a light in my life. I've built some of the best relationships that I have uh, that I have uh, through landscape lighting. So I'm, my hope and my goal for you is that you find the same. Jan and I um, have become friends, and I reached out to her out of the blue. So you know, you have access to a lot of very talented people who have a lot of experience when you're partnering with a manufacturer. So I would definitely say reach out, find a mentor and get with some people and, and get educated. We have over 28 years of experience accompanying entrepreneurs to help them build multi-million dollar landscape lighting companies. We just had um, Kyle McKelvey here from Oregon Outdoor Lighting, and he has built a He's done $30 million in landscape lighting in 15 years, which is unheard of. Um, they've got the recipe and the pattern down, and we do have a proven method for success. We've learned from our partners over the past 28 years. A lot of that recipe is uh, followed, and our partners grow on to build multi-million dollar companies. We have been direct to the contractor since inception. That's also to AV Partners. We have uh, invested interest in your growth and success. So when we share our story with you, we're hoping that we can become part of your story um, and work together as a team. Um, we have experience in, in skilled inside sales team. I'm going to introduce that team to you. Hopefully my I'm looking at my computer here and, and this one's actually uh, showing me a battery. So I'm going to maybe have to switch computers, but um, I want to introduce you to our team. They have significant tenure and they act as mentors to our partners. Um, it, whether you're starting out in landscape lighting, you're new to landscape lighting, we have a lot of experience working with people that are just getting introduced into the landscape lighting space and we want to share that information with you. Um, so mentor and role models from other entrepreneurs. You know, somebody like Jan, like I said, if, you know, getting into the landscape lighting, it can be, in, you know, intimidating if you're not sure on how to use the technology, what technology to use, where to start when you're going out to these, you know, $2 million to, you know, 15, $20 million residents. It's a lot of landscape lighting that's needed and you have to have the knowledge in order to create a successful 
landscape lighting design for your clients. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of as well is we've built lasting relationships with our partners that have, some of them have been doing business with Rato and I for over uh, 25 years. I'm very proud of that. And um, so we would like to build a lasting relationship with you. Um, innovative, high quality products. You know, uh, any of you that are not familiar with the Garden Light LED brand, we have a very, very high quality product line. It's built here right in the USA. Um, our products empower you and help you boost your profits. Um, we also are very proud of the fact that our partners can uh, add a margin to the products, not only the services and the installation, the design side, but we drive our costs down to make sure that you guys can add margins to the product offering. Bulletproof fixtures that are made um, for lighting designers. Uh, we have everything that you could possibly need for a full landscape lighting system. So a lot of different modules, a lot of different um, high quality products, 20 year warranty on our product. Um, and I really don't wanna pitch you guys a lot on the product. So I wanna tell you that if you'd like to talk to me after this webinar, I will definitely be reaching out to uh, anybody that's on, but you can always feel free to, to call me here at Garden Light and I will walk you through some of the differentiators that will help your company and uh, set you apart from your competition. Obviously, we all know that landscape lighting with high quality products, it, it improves the aesthetics and enhances the visual appeal of the property. We want to deliver a high quality product with a very high quality design. Um, and we want it to be sustainable so that way you guys don't get service calls. This is very important. There's a lot of manufacturers that are out there. There's great products. But I can tell you with working with Garden Light LED for over 22 years, I know what goes into our product. We have engineers on staff. And also um, when you work with Garden Light, you have access to not only a team of people that are care about your success, we are invested in your success and you have access to our engineers. So that's really great because we, in landscape lighting design, you always run across situations. And what I love to do is to solve any challenge and come up with a solution. And you will absolutely run into challenges on projects when you are out there. You're working in a lot of different uh, in elements and environments. So you really wanna have a partner and somebody that has a lot of experience and um, becoming a better lighting designer. I met Jan in uh, 2016, 2017. I reached out to her on the phone um, she is probably one of the most recognizable landscape lighting designers, uh, prolific in her education that she's created. And I'll tell you, she never misses an opportunity to share. And I, I admire her so much. She's my mentor. But what I appreciate as well is I can ask her anything and I can come to her and learn and be humble because no question is too uh, small. And I've, I've really appreciated that. And I definitely have seen the benefits in upping my game in lighting design. I really started doing projects um, for service within the past five years. So having Jan Lennox Moyer as a resource and um, following the books and uh, the landscape lighting book the art of landscape lighting. And now recently, uh, after 22 years attending ILLY has helped me um, tremendously. So why do you wanna become a better landscape lighting designer? Because you're gonna uh, have access to better projects. Your lighting designs are gonna be good versus bad. We've all seen bad lighting. The more you know, the better you're gonna be able to deliver um, for your clients. And um, you wanna be able to work with landscape architects and lighting designers. I've worked with several now after you know gaining the confidence to just reach out to Jan. And um, I can tell you right now, they are extremely grateful when somebody calls them that can do the work. You guys have your, you know, the ability to deliver the full solution. So I would absolutely say it gives you a competitive advantage. You're already out on these properties, so it's critical that you take the whole job. Offer your customers. You build those relationships with them. Learn about landscape lighting design. This will help your reputation, and also you'll get referrals. 
What I love about landscape lighting design is it's also transformational. I have total respect for what you guys are doing out there within the, on the AV side and the smart homes and everything that's available to us today. I'm going to tell you right now, you are going to get so excited when you do a reveal after you've created an amazing landscape lighting design for your clients. So those are the benefits of becoming a great landscape lighting designer. There are so many tools and resources available to you today um, that are just exceptional. And I highly recommend that you keep them close to you. I carry this book with me. This is The Art of Landscape Lighting. It's the um, designer's companion. And what's great about this is I show this to my customers um, so they understand that I'm not just out there, you know, kind of playing with light. I'm transforming their space. I'm during the client interview, I'm talking with them. I'm sharing with them, you know, my education, where I've learned from, you know, what why they should value, you know, good landscape lighting and 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 make that investment because it's not an inexpensive investment either. So lots of tools and resources are available for you. Um, Learn Nightlight is available on the IES. That is 20 sessions on critical topics. And it's basically the breakdown. And what I also love about all, both of Jan's books, which is the Landscape Lighting book, which was originally published in 1993. That's on its third edition. These are available on Amazon or through Rutledge, which if you guys have any questions, you can call me after this webinar and I will share with you everything that I know and places you can get this information. These are super easy and resourceful because it's by topic and by category. So if you're looking at, I had a customer ask me the other day, okay, what, or what kind of screw do I use when I'm hanging down lights in a tree? The answer is stainless steel screws. Well, I looked through here and I found it within two seconds. So any question that you have pertaining to landscape lighting, it's available in the resource uh, tools that Jan is the author and designer of, which is the landscape lighting book and the art of landscape lighting, and she paints with light. But now we also have Learn Night Light, which is available through the IES. And it's basically, as I said, 20 sessions, videos, workbooks, photographs, uh, 20, it's worth 20 CEU credits for those of you that um, maintain that. Um, and these are other organizations that you, you want to look into and, and potentially be a part of. So the Illuminating Engineering Society is one as well. Um, the International Landscape Lighting Institute was founded by Janet Lennox Moyer. Wow. Uh, as I said, I went to it for the first time in the spring. It's a five day. They do it in the spring. They do it in the, uh, in the fall. It's a five day intensive. Um, it was a blast. I learned so much. And you have mentors almost the ratio from attendees to mentors, and which is really, really critical because it allows you to have the freedom to create something with your team, but it also has um, the guidelines and best practice that you're con constantly bouncing ideas off of. So I would say for sure, 100% if you have the opportunity please look into the Landscape Lighting Institute, Illy. It's a spectacular experience. I was concerned, just to be honest, that five days, what am I gonna do for five days with all these lighting designers and um, these type A personalities? Because everybody out there is extremely talented. And I tell you what, I would do it over and over again. And I'm hoping for the opportunity to mentor mm -hmm. and kind of share what I learned as well in the future. The Association of Outdoor Lighting Professionals, AOLP, it is one of the only um, institutions for landscape lighting professionals. You can look into what they offer, and I highly recommend that as well. The very best slide, aside from everything that you're about to experience with Janet Lennox Moyer, is our people. We have a very passionate team. I am. I get up and do this. Uh, for people that know me, I get nervous and speaking in public and also sometimes just don't really like it, but I'll tell you what, I will do it any day, any day for every single person in this building. I am so honored and so proud to be the role model and the spoke person, spokesperson on behalf of my team and every single person that's in this building. You have people that believe in you and that want you to succeed. 
Louise has been with our company for uh, 14 years, Mario 11, Rich and Bruce are school friends. Uh, they, Rich has been with our company for five years. Uh, and Bruce Kennison, which I, you, a lot of you have met, he's done some webinars for you guys. He's amazing. He has over 20 years of experience in landscape lighting and never gets tired of talking about landscape lighting. So you have a team of people that want you to succeed and uh, we are all here for you. So I do want to um, let you know if anybody would like to contact me, as I mentioned, I am available and um, I'm a phone call away. So I'd love the opportunity to get to know you. Um, Without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to one of the most recognized names in the Landscape Lighting Institute, or excuse me, in the landscape lighting world. That's Janet Lennox Moyer. Um, she is um, iconic. She's been at this for, I don't want to give her age away. Is that okay if I do, Jan? I'm not going to say, but for <laughs> almost, uh, oh, Jan, four decades, five decades. Five. Five decades. And like I said, she's available and never turns down an opportunity. She is a two-time GE award winner. She is a fellow at the International Association of Lighting Designers. She is an IES trailblazer, the founder of Illy, and the author and designer of The Art of Landscape Lighting. And her newest, or actually the Landscape Lighting book, and her newest book that was released almost a year ago, which I can't believe, the art of landscape lighting. So without further ado, Jan, I am going to turn it over you, over to you. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Whew. That was a lot. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jason, for letting us do this session. Thank you, Michelle, for including me and Andrew for helping us make this work. Landscape lighting is a complicated design field as things are continually changing. The plants grow, they bloom, some go dormant, they change leaf color between seasons, then people add and delete areas or focal points. I'm going to give you a glimpse into the design thinking for, a, for creating a cohesive visual composition to provide your client additional rooms to enjoy at night. In 1913, Walter de R.C. Ryan, the chief of illumination for the 1915 Pan Pacific Exposition in San Francisco, wrote, in order to obtain a harmonious illumination scheme, it was necessary to visualize the lighting across the scene as a whole. Look at the scale of these lighting fixtures. Paraphrasing Mr. Ryan, pre-exposition, there were many who maintained that the public would not be attracted except by the glare of exposed brilliant sources. However, the lighting scheme and scope of the exposition called for a radical departure from this previous practice. For the first time, illuminating sources lost their identity. They were gone. The lighting of the exposition immediately disproved that previous theory and a strong psychological appeal was made by the highly artistic lighting effects. So 110 years later, whoops, sorry, 110 years later, this is what we often see in our neighborhoods across the country. Do the trees look good? Does the house look inviting? Is it how you imagine the property looking at night when you see it during the day? It gets dark every night. We need to continue Mr. Ryan's example of making night amazing, comfortable, and beautiful, a place we can enjoy. Lighting can reveal elements that compose our gardens. It can provide a beautiful setting for us to continue enjoying our property. It reconnects us to the landscape. I always start my planning with downlighting. In this case, six tree-mounted downlights, two and four watts, reveal the ground plane. In this case, showing the amazing cactus below the ironwood tree in this driveway island. Downlighting always looks natural and is less dramatic than uplighting, and it requires little maintenance. Fixtures don't get knocked over by the gardener's vehicle shovels or grown over by ground covers or perennials. Some of these downlights also contribute to revealing the trunk and branching structure. Then, six below grade uplighting fixtures between four and seven and a half watts fill in the trunk and light the canopy. This tree is about 40 foot across and the uplighting penetrates some of the canopy, but not all, so there is a play of light and shadow. Note that the canopy looks rounded, 
but the canopy goes much further left and right. Having light throughout the canopy creates a believable shape for this tree, even though I didn't light the entire canopy. Here you see that scene in the daytime. The ironwood tree is much bigger than it appears in the lit version. Due to the driveway paving, which is extensive, as you can see, I had to create a smaller version of the tree at night. I didn't use below grade fixtures in the paving or fixtures in any of the beds at the far reaches of paving due to the way people move through the space at night. Avoiding any fixture glare would have been impossible and this is part of design uh, making, um, this decision making process. Here are two of the below grade uplights. Note two things. First, the small size to avoid disrupting roots and how I've positioned the glare shield. Then note on the right, there's a black louver over the fixture to ensure that you don't see the brightness of the lamp from the driveway as that fixture is located so close to the driveway. This scene is to the right of the ironwood tree, helping to keep you moving into the entertainment garden beyond. Each individual scene of an overall garden needs to be carefully balanced, as I have with that initial view, then this view to the lizard, so that all views blend as you move into a garden and through a garden. This path light with running salukis as the pattern bridges between those two scenes and helps direct your movement towards the distant sitting area. Arrival is one of the goals we work with in night lighting. I start by imagining what a space could look like. Here I thought the texture on this door was important, if not amazing. Then I thought, okay, people are walking along an uneven path towards steps that might not meet standards, and that first step up onto the patio you might consider dangerous. This home is a series of Japanese structures with covered walkways between them, so I had a place to mount down lights. I lit the shrubs on both sides of the walkway, and surprise, the plat path is lit well, and the steps show without actually lighting either. The door is the brightest element in this composition, drawing your eye to the entry. Down lights close to the door show the texture and do not shine in your eyes as you walk through that door. This Northern California Hills home has a large brick wall encompassing excuse me, the front garden with planting flanking the walkway to the front door. As with many homes, the front door is dark and at night will require help for guests to get to see it. People are always changing their properties and at the time of this photo, they were adding a front gate. The lighting helps make this space feel like an outdoor room. The house numbers are clearly visible on the brick wall. Then the brick wall is let go dark with your eye moving to the right wall and down the path. The front door is very clear behind that big maple tree, which should have been the focal point of the space, but couldn't due to its location by the door. Down lights all along the right wall light the plantings and spill onto the walk as down the down light and the trees to the left, creating a clear and enjoyable path guiding guests, guests excuse me, to that front door and giving a beautiful setting around them as they walk. This lighting plan shows that the maple has five up lights and then there's one down light to show the overall form of the trunk and branching structure and the overall size and shape of the canopy. The down light provides some ground plane information completing the visual scene inside the garden space. This pair of images shows the tree from the front door during the day. With the five foot overhang and brick wall, your view of the tree from that location is limited. As you walk out the door at night, you see the trunk and the canopy essentially as a sculpture. I used a strong uplight on the left side of the trunk, creating a halo effect. Then this is softened by a soft wash on the trunk from the right to balance the effect on the trunk. This is how landscape lighting designers are often introduced to a project, no landscape lighting. So we need to study the plans. The landscape, like, the landscape architect, excuse me, provides varying amounts of information about projects in varying formats. Here, the plants are identified by lines with arrows to the symbols and a notation of the container size. Landscape lighting designers need to become familiar with the plants used on the project and the size of the plants as they will arrive on site. This always requires a discussion with the lighting, the landscape designer, excuse me. And those designers always change the type, the number, and or the size of the plants as a project develops. Landscape lighting designers need to stay in touch with the landscape architect to stay current with these changes, as they don't always remember to keep us updated. 
Note that I've colored each plant so that I can see the plant's relationship and begin to form a visual picture of this garden space. One of our first goals is to assist guests to get to the front entry safely without any concerns. Each property differs. In landscape lighting, we use a lot of tools that we learn from every other type of lighting, starting with theater. We use multiple fixtures to create sense, to create shape, excuse me, and a sense of depth. We use the introduction of light to help direct people's view, and we use contrast of color and or contrast of brightness to attract attention. Normally, a combination of up and down lighting is used. Up lighting shows vertical surfaces and form. Down lighting shows the ground plane and provides a normal understanding for our eyes as we experience the earth from the sun with down lighting every day. These arrows show the down lighting that helps define the space and direct a visitor's eye to the front door. Notice that I downlit the front right edge of the planting circle, then the back left edge. Our brains fill in between these two cl cl clues to complete the planting circle. Then I have downlighting on the right edge of the driveway between the circle and the front stairs and downlighting on that left wall, completing a cohesive view to the entry and still respecting the night darkness in this remote South Carolina location. Looking closely at that left wall, you see this bird and the interesting stone treatment of this wall that provides that line of light at the back of the scene previously. But more than that, the lighting effect on the wall shows that incredible detail and the bird all with one down light that also uses spill from the lamp to graze the palm trunk, visually tying that tree to the ground. From about 2012 to 2020, I changed many existing projects from halogen to LED, primarily to save energy as the usual energy savings is about 70 to 90%. So let's look at this front garden during the day, then with halogen and then how it changes with LED. In this garden, the entire lawn is left unlit using the trees on either side to frame the view. Often landscaping vignettes are a part of a composition as it was with this portion of this front yard. We started by framing the view to the sculpture by lighting the fruit trees. Then we gave the sculpture a backdrop by softly abutting the hedge behind it. And then we focused attention on the sculpture. This illustrates the idea of structuring many compositions within the overall composition. The focal point sculptures required light from the left at ground level and from the right at roof level to show the three dimensional characteristics of this combination of objects. Notice I left an, an, an area surrounding the sculpture dark, which increases the brightness contrast, ensuring that the sculpture becomes the focal point in this scene. Uh, then as we're planning the lighting time, we need to think about the characteristic of the tree, its size coming to the project and future size, how it looks from one season to another, its trunk, its leaves, its um, flowers. This is the original halogen. And now we see how it changed when it went to LED. First, notice that the fruit trees have changed to orange trees, from, from orange trees to olive trees. This type of change in the landscape is typical over time as we maintain our projects from now until eternity. Look at how the dark area behind the sculpture is gone and the shadows are gone on the sculpture. The color appearance has shifted with the LED to much cooler. This overall lighting effect is softer, using less candle power, and it is now less dramatic. Changing projects from halogen to LED, I learned that you cannot use the same candle power beam spread that you had previously with traditional lamps in an attempt to create the same imagery. While the overall effect here is still nice and the clients are happy, it's different from what I originally designed. I am now being more careful about selecting the candle power and beam spread of LED, not just thinking of it as a one-to-one -one change out. To help you understand how parts of a scene work together in creating a comfortable night setting or a visual composition, let's start by identifying the primary focal point. Here it's the sculpture with the number one on it. In this case, 70% reflection, light color, smooth surface, but not shiny, similar to the sculpture in the earlier slide. In creating a comfortable composition, it helps to have the boundary. So the hedge becomes the secondary element in the scene. The hedge has a 15% reflectance. We want the perceived brightness to be in the range of three to one to five to one. We'll discuss this more in an upcoming slide. With a 15% reflectance, 
we need to put seven foot candles, dramatically more than the five foot candles on the sculpture and way out of the range of most light levels used at night to have the hedge appear three times less bright than the sculpture. This is not intrinsically obvious. Put lots more light on the object you want to appear three to five times less bright, but it's critical for us to understand. Then the lawn becomes the third element, visually tying the two primary elements together, leaving the path to be the least important element with the least amount of light. This also may not seem obvious. It's based on the psychological fact that humans are upright beings and we see vertical surfaces in our, our surroundings before we notice horizontal surfaces. If you like trees, buildings, hedges, sculptures, anything vertical, the scene will feel more comfortable than if you concentrate on the lawn or a walkway or the roadway. The chart on the left is straight out of the IES handbook used in my um, landscape lighting book all the way through. Note how there's one entry for plants, mean vegetation. Well, in landscape lighting, we need to understand the reflectance of all elements in our lighting scene, all the architecture and plants. Snow here gets two entries, new and old. It's imperative that lighting designer understand all the reflectance in the scene we're lighting, not just the ones we intend to light, but all. Reflectance is made up of three conditions, color, texture, and finish. Lighter colors reflect more light, objects with less texture reflect more light, objects with a shiny finish reflect more light. On the right, the two charts show how color and reflectance affect how, we, how an object will look to our eye. On top, lighting three elements to the same light level, 100 foot candles, which of course is ridiculous. Humans, you and I, as we all know, do not see foot candles. We see reflected light, foot lamberts. The top chart shows that the white paint will look to your eye more than 10 times brighter than the grass because of a lighter color and less texture. The only reason the grass, typical lawn grass, even has a 6% reflectance is the shiny finish on each blade. To make these three objects look similar, the bottom chart shows that the grass needs to have 13 times as much light on it. The issue of how an object will reflect light is the crux of complete creating a pleasing uh, visual scene at night. These rows of light fixtures down this corridor, corridor are ex uh, spaced exactly the same, and yet the appearance on the two walls is very different. Note the floor looks evenly lit, so the light is balanced on the floor, but the red wall is a lighter color with the shiny finish um, on its smooth surface, making it appear brighter to your eye. The brick wall on the right is a darker color with more texture and a rough finish. All three of these conditions making it appear a darker to our eye. Light levels are recommended by the IES and everyone in the US follows these numbers in lighting, including court cases about whether someone can see an obstacle in the path. Understanding brightness relationships starts with thinking about typical foot candle levels, even though we don't see foot candles. On a night with a full moon, when you go out and let your eyes adjust to the lower outdoor lighting levels, which takes about 20 minutes, the moonlight is about 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 foot candles, enough to read a newspaper, a difficult visual task. If you're over 40 or younger with any eye conditions, you may need glasses to focus on the newspaper, but there is enough light. Daylight at a north window, 50 to 200 foot candles. Outdoor shade, 100 to 1,000. Direct sun, 5,000 to 10,000. Office lighting, 30 to 100. This is a chart in the third edition of the landscape lighting book. What isn't listed is that residential interior lighting levels vary between 10 to 20. So still much lower, but dramatically higher than our outdoor lighting levels. Um, it doesn't take much light to see at night. The distribution of the light rather than light levels is our critical issue. In this country, the guidelines for street and sidewalk lighting, night lighting, consists of levels much lower than daylight or office or residential. Typically in our homes, we have 10 to 20, but outdoor lighting levels vary from 0.25 to one foot candle typically. Some areas might go up to two foot candles for a lot of effect, and sometimes a focal point may go all the way up to five, but it's unusual. 0.025 to one is the normal range for landscape lighting. So we've talked about reflectance, we've talked about light level. 
To create a lighting scene, we need to understand luminance ratios, the difference in brightness from one element or another in a landscape to another. As a two to one ratio of reflected, flight, reflected light of two foot Lamberts or one foot Lambert marks the level where a human can start to see a difference. It takes concentration to see the difference and it's not enough to draw your eye from one area or object to another. Three to one to five to one is the range of difference between one object or another in a seat that serves as good contrast to have them appear different to our eye at night. From five to one to 10 to one is the range that works to fill between the primary focal point and the areas filling between or surrounding the secondary levels. More than that, um, during night, low light levels will simply be too much. Bigger ratios work in bars and clubs and restaurants or stores, just not in outdoor landscape spaces. Once you know that, then the basic rule to increase a sense of depth requires that the brightest area needs to be in the background. Because interiors are brighter than landscape spaces, typically the foreground will be the next brightness to help your eyes adjust to moving to less light. Therefore, the midground would be the softest level. This illustrates that typical pattern of brightness creating um, depth. With the brightest level at the back to increase a sense of depth, the second brightest outside the doors, and then the middle the softest. <clears throat> this view is seen from the formal dining room of this house. The hedge planted in the 1800s has a strong impact on this garden. In early discussions, the team decided to remove a section of the head to provide a view to the more distant part of the property. Lighting the hedge is all done by downlighting from overhanging trees and aimed to show the undulating form of the hedges. Note how I increased the brightness at the curves to accentuate the form and frame the view. In all projects, we need to understand how plants will change from one season to another and the impact this will have on a scene. Lighting the bench area, the brightest, creates a sense of expansiveness in the garden. Softly uplighting the big tree due to only lighting the uplight, uplighting the smaller trees provides the final framework um, for the bench scene. This slide shows how the light looks at night in the summer. I start to call the, I have started years ago to call the summer the dark months as lighting doesn't have as much effect as it does in other months. And it's often not as important because it doesn't get till uh, late in the day cycle and most of us have gone to bed. Not all you party or so. Landscape lighting reveals really helps us in spring, fall, and especially winter. It is those times when it is dark, when we're leaving our homes to go to work, and as we arrive back home again, it's dark. We lose our connection to the gardens in those seasons without lighting. This is a close-up of that distant scene. Note that it's a cohesive composition on its own. This needs to occur throughout the garden spaces, especially larger spaces, so that people have interesting, useful views as they move through the space. Then look how it changed from early fall to midsummer, and over time as it was changed to LED in 2013. Lighting can direct movement, helping people experience the garden and reach their destination. Here you're approaching the final entry gate, the third along a several mile private drive approach. Most of the way there is no lighting for privacy sake. This is the first lighting that introduces the last gate. So guests know that they're progressing and eventually will arrive at the home. Note how there is uplighting the trees along the right hand side and the brightness is similar to the alley beyond, which we'll see in a moment. Flanking the gate is softer lighting on the much bigger uh, trees and down lighting to fill in the lit scene from left to right and front to back, providing visual transportation across the scene. Once passing through that last gate, guests come upon this alley. You can see that the brightness relationship between the tree's canopy and the front door is critical to draw your eye to that front door. In another season, the effect on the ALA is different, but as stunning. Each tree has one trunk light and four other below grade fixtures for the canopies. Looking at the ALA from the owner's guest house, you can see the big trees surrounding the ALA and how the ALA having, uh, <clears throat> and how the ALA trees having light tying the trunks to the ground. And the overall lighting is very balanced from one individual tree to another, essentially making the ALA one element in the overall scene. 
And then in the background at left, you can see lighting settings that help guide you out of the property. There are many issues to think about when we start a landscape lighting design. How to communicate with clients who know very little and have seen a lot of bad lighting. Where do we start? Do we light the house? Do we consider only the public or street view? Do we try to connect an interior to the landscape by creating views through windows? How much light is needed? Where should we put it? The, the list goes on. I moved to Arizona in 2015, a state very concerned about dark sky issues. This is my roof. The former owners were careful about glare as you can see from these well-shielded sconces. When George and I moved in, I changed all the house lighting immediately to LED. So these have six and a half watt LED A lamps in them. Then look at my neighbors across the street. Typical clear glass post top and sconces, still incandescent and probably 75 watts or more. And as you can see, it's not even dark yet. The glare there will simply get worse as darkness falls, whether it's incandescent or LED. As long as the wildly emerging market filled with very many talented people from the electronics world works with our lighting industry and learns to understand our basic foundation knowledge of good techniques, our lighting industry stands to move forward and offer better landscape lighting for many. While working on the third edition of the landscape lighting book, I worked for two years to study with chip manufacturers, packagers, and landscape lighting and controls manufacturers to ultra educate myself in order to update three chapters, light sources, fixtures, and controls, to advise us what we would need to look for in the future because I knew that when the book came out, technology would have moved on. With each meeting, my head was spinning trying to digest all this new information and figure out what it means for the future of landscape lighting. At the end of the first three hour meeting, I asked the person I was meeting with, how long till this settles down? His answer was 10 to 20 years. We're now in 2023 at year 14 of that time frame, and there is no settling down, as has happened with all previous light source advances. As the future catches us, we have the potential of providing more options for more folks to have access to good quality outdoor lighting. At the same time, we run the risk of throwing away decades of development. For example, simple shielding of glaring light sources on street and roadway for fixtures or landscape fixtures. Even though this is an old ad, notice that only one fixture has shielding of the LED sources. This is a huge problem for us today. In my little town, Rio Verde, our power supplier, SRP, is starting to replace our existing high-pressure sodium fixtures, which are very warm, 1900 degrees Kelvin, with very cold LED lamps that create enormous glare. If you look at the upper level photograph image, uh, that's the high pressure sodium and the right, it's the LED. You can see how much more glary that LED fixture is, how much brighter and colder the effect is. Our issue for community comfort and respecting the night sky um, is concerned about the amount of light, the color of light and shielding. The lamp in any space when visible will be the brightest thing in our field of view. So if you look at the upper, um, the lower photo, you'll see that the left lamp, the high pressure shielding is recessed into the housing. You don't see it from down below, but the, all of the LED chips are right at the glass. So you see all of that from a distance and it gets worse as you get close, closer. The angle that you aim a fixture is critical in all projects to avoid lamp brightness that detracts from the brightness of the overall scene. The perfect aiming angle to prevent a person from seeing the lamp inside a fixture and just, and, or to see the brightness in the inside wall of the fixture is zero degrees, called nadir when aiming down and zenith when aiming straight up. The basic rule applies whether aiming up or down. However, aiming straight up or straight down does not always allow a fixture to do exactly what we want. We typically have to aim at some angle. To minimize glare, the aiming angle should not be more than 35 degrees, period. There are always times to break the rules. In this case, if no one will ever see the fixture on the property you're lighting and on all neighboring properties, or if there's some obstacle like a plant, uh, a wall that stops the view of the fixture, um, then a higher aiming angle can be utilized. <clears throat> the view from this family dining room is a series of adjustable up lights integrated into the short edge and aimed at about 12 to 15 degrees towards the center of the arbor. Each one grazes the vines 
and emphasizes the curved nature of the arbor. The fixture brightness is not seen by people walking down the path. Notice that I have both up and down lighting on the greenhouse structure and the plants inside the greenhouse uh, and in front of the greenhouse, providing a visual destination. Many years ago in the 1980s, I mounted fixtures in the structure of this greenhouse to downlight the plantings around the greenhouse. Um, all of them are aimed at less than 20 degrees, so you don't see the brightness. All you see is the inside of the fixture, but you can't stop your eye from going to look at that. Two years later, I convinced the manufacturer, after a lot of plant growth also, to make a glare shield to fit over the body. Now you can look at the scene instead of noticing the fixtures, which is what we prefer. To control glare, consider three issues. First, lamp location in the fixture housing. If the lamp is slightly recessed in the housing, less likely that someone will see the lamp. Adding a honeycomb louver in front of the lamp or any lensing material provides 45 to 60 degree um, uh, shielding. And lastly, adding a, an angled glare shield to block the, block the brightness of the uh, inside of the fixture. <clears throat> so I haven't found a fixture yet that can't be um, shielded. Um, and today, most manufacturers offer louvers that are honeycomb like these that you see. Then you want to think about the glare shield. I prefer the glare shields to be a separate element so that you can move it up and down on the housing as well as twist it left to right. This is a slide that shows what changed when a fixture moved from um, halogen to LED. On the left was halogen. On the right, just a few months later, was LED. And that's what showed up on our project. There is no shielding of that lens. So we had to make that black shield on our own before we can convince the manufacturer by asking him to visit us at the job site. This to show what happens when um, water attacks any of the electronics. I put this sealed um, light fixture in my garage uh, for the winter. And when I turned, put it back out on the table in the spring, it didn't turn on. I opened it up. It had not been opened at all. It was completely shield, sealed, and yet moisture had gotten in and caused that corrosion. <clears throat> Landscape lighting is a set of soft brush strokes. And here's a change from the original halogen to LED. Notice how the plant material looks much more beautiful with more blue in the LED, but the trunk looked more beautiful before and we've lost the shadows on the trunk. Nothing changed. In the landscape lighting book, I break up all trees into categories of shapes. These are all um, the same shape, but different trees, some here in the United States, some in um, Australia. And yet the techniques that we use are the same for any of these. This is another tree of a similar shape here in Arizona, and you notice I'm treating it slightly differently. In this case, I'm having more light on the trunk and less on the canopy, which is unusual. You usually have less on the trunk, more on the canopy, just to keep our eyes at ground plane, which makes us feel more comfortable in a very dark space. We need to think about um, the density of the canopy of a tree. Notice on the left side, these two trees have a very dense canopy. The leaves are big and they're dense and they're dark, a lot of overlap. The trees on the right have almost no overlap and they're very, um, uh, they, they let light go through them much more quickly. This is a very dense um, uh, tree. It's only about <clears throat> 15 foot high and wide. Um, and you can see that I've had to light all of the outside of the tree and a little bit on the trunk just to show its overall form because it's such a dense tree. I love this series of slides to show you the difference between up lighting and down lighting. You can see that the path is up a hill on the right and we've got a lot of flags for doing our mock-up. This is just the down lighting and you can see it doesn't look very good, but notice that it provides light on the ground plane. That's its purpose. This is just the uplighting, notice how much better it looks. But the ground plane is dark, which is why it's best to have a combination of both. And notice that those hot spots we saw in the trees when it was just downlighting disappear with the uplighting. <clears throat> um, 
this is a very quiet space, which is what landscape lighting can do. Just create calm and tranquility. We don't have to create a lot of activity. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was working with ponds was how when you've got uplighting on plants at a, the edge of a um, water body where there's a change in elevation, which there often is, you get this disconnect between um, the planting and the reflection of the planting. So I came up with this technique called shore scraping, which is what's shown at night to reconnect it and make it feel more comfortable. And sometimes you might want to use one or the other, but when you're using shore scraping, um, you've got to turn it off at night um, because there's no way to shield those fixtures that are aimed at almost 90 degrees. You can see straight at you if you're up on the shore. <clears throat> this is another um, shore scraping, a very different technique. Um, just gives you a tiny little bit of light to show you the edges of the pool and the lake around it. I started understanding landscape lighting in this room. I was hired to light the living room, but quickly realized that without proper lighting, um, you, I wouldn't be able to fix the interior, so I had to do the landscape lighting. When you're thinking about what you see out the window, it can be anywhere. That tree that's just outside that kitchen window is all the way at the far end of the garage, and that window is um, at the edge of the house by the greenhouse. We need to think about how landscape blending can help move us through space from one area to another as you experience a space. And then look at this beautiful view out someone's window. She made sure that you can see that, uh, she can see that when she goes to sleep and the lights turn off and then they turn on before it, a light, the sun comes up so she can see it again in the morning. I'm gonna skip a few slides because we are way behind and I want to, you need to hear all this. It's all in the landscape lighting book. I need to tell you about how much more beautiful it is in snow and then talk quickly about pruning, lifting the canopy, opening the canopy up so the air can move it is perfect for the health of the tree and it really helps us with landscape lighting. And here's a most beautiful space done with LED and notice we've convinced the owners to just let that beautiful scene reflect in the surface of the pool, but just in the last few weeks, um, a landscape architect that I deal with, Kirk Bianchi, wanted to see if we could try to have the landscape lighting in the pool on, or the underwater lighting in the pool, and not lose that reflection. And so we use some PAL fixtures that are completely dimmable, dim them all the way down, and you can see this actually makes the space look even better. We're always able to learn new things. Thank you for spending time with me today. Jan, that was amazing. Just incredible, incredible uh, photography, by the way. And I know we have a short video that um, really kind of encapsulates a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about. So, uh, Andrew, you want to go ahead and run that video for for everybody on the uh, on the uh, webinar? It's like an aha moment. It may be moving a fixture a half an inch in terms of aiming, but I see it and a little smile just comes across my face. I worked on this project called Walnut Creek Manor in Walnut Creek, California. And we lit all the pathways so they could see how beautiful their home was. Eventually I realized that, that not everybody knew everything that I knew. So then I started writing the landscape lighting book. And what happened was that I started getting calls before the book even came out. I had become known worldwide. There was this little voice in the back of my head. The little voice kept saying, you have worked so hard, you've gained all this knowledge, you should share it. I like every scene in a garden to feel complete, allowing your eye to move from one area to another and almost feel like you've been told a story. Our society understands how important landscape lighting is. 
Walking the site helps us get a sense of how the space feels and the relationship of elements to one another. And I start visualizing what could be done in my mind. You've got to communicate what, what you actually design to the installers who are not in your brain and they never will be. We need light to, to scare away the darkness. We've made this big leap from old technology to LED. Change is going to happen. We have to accept LED. We have to let go of our old technologies. LED brings things to landscape lighting that we've never had. What is it going to need today, and what will it need five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, so that when your client calls and says, you know, this tree just doesn't look like it used to, you can fix it. Hi, I'm Janet Lennox Moyer. I'm a lighting designer specializing in landscape lighting for 43 years. All right, uh, fantastic. Um, you know, we have bumped up against the time. I had so many questions. I have a quick question, uh, uh, Jan. Let me just throw this one out real quick for, for uh, the audience. Is there any sort of a formula that you use when you're looking at the square footage of a property that says how many lights are going to be necessary to light that? Or is it really um, arbitrary and based on, on the number of plants and, and other, other elements? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's arbitrary, but it's definitely based on what is there to light. I've gone to some projects where there's nothing to light because it's too new. And in that case, you just want to do power distribution to prepare for doing the lighting in the future. Yeah. A quick question that came in for you, uh, Michelle. Um, somebody asking about whether Garden Light LED has a global presence, in particularly in India. Yes, we've had that um, question proposed many times. Uh, at this time, we do have a little bit of, um, you know, market share, very, very, very little. Um, we would like more. I definitely would be willing to communicate. Um, Jan and I did a large presentation for Brazil, um, of many lighting designers from Brazil, and we've talked about expanding the um, Learn Nightlight for uh, a global, more of a global presence in different languages. So we're open. Um, definitely email me. My email is Michelle at Garden Light LED. If anybody would like to get a hold of me, or you can always go to the website. And like I said, um, our number's listed there, and you can reach me directly. And I will definitely communicate um, with anybody on. on um, our side here or over on the other side of the world as well. Look forward to it. Great. We are a few minutes over here, but I'm going to uh, run through a couple of other quick questions. Is This was actually a question that I kind of had also about controllable controllability of the lights um, and also the use of colored lamps versus uh, white light, Jan. Is that something you want to let the plant have the, the color or... Is that something you do use color lights? And what about the controllability and the LED side to change the color? Is that a common thing or is that of uh, uh, something that's verboten? <laughs> there are many, many, many manufacturers that offer um, color changing <clears throat> fixtures. Even in that pool, I showed we had it turned way to the darkest blue um, so that it would look pretty. Um, and I don't do that very often because I think that the plants have their own color and they look beautiful with their own color, but it's really up to the client. I always say that we as designers and not artists need to put our feelings aside sometimes and do what's right for the client. And in terms of controllability, LED has really complicated dimming. So you guys probably know more about that than most of us do. The way that everything has to work together between the control device itself and all the electronics in the lighting fixtures um, makeup. All right. One last question. This is kind of uh, for both of you. Um, I know Michelle uh, Garden Light has um, these great sales kits, Showtime a Closer Kit and Presentation Kit that integrators can use that they can go out and, and kind of showcase what lighting can do. And then, Jan, I noticed in one of your photos, you had the flag layout there on kind of that preliminary 
what is the, the process there? Is this a really a trial by error um, scenario, or do you have a a plan when you go in and then you 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 deploy it and then you tweak it, or how does it generally work? It's a it's a trial by planning. Um, I've been doing this as we talked about for almost fifty years, and at this point in time, I don't show any light fixtures on my contract documents. I'll show a note that says allow for up to this many of this type of fixture on this. Um, control zone and this transformer. Um, and then I flag all the locations. And then at night, we, we determine the actual locations to get the best effect. As much design happens at night when we're aiming as in the original um, uh, schematic design scheme session. All right. <clears throat> and Michelle, I know those two um, uh, presentation kits that I mentioned that you have, you mentioned them up front. Those are things that integrators have access to through Garden Light LED, correct? Yes, absolutely. And this goes back to becoming a better lighting designer. Um, you know, if you know what you're doing and what you're looking for, yes, it changes when you're in the field and you see the different plant material and what you're actually lighting. But there are basic principles that you know what you're looking for and you, need, you figure out what's important on the property to light. Um, so yes, education is very important. We do have the sales tools that um, are a great um, mechanism to be able to support the lighting design um, for the customer and also kind of transform the space to give them an experience. A lot of people have been building houses. They've been, um, you know, dealing with their builders and landscapers and they, when you can transform their space and show them some possibilities, it really makes a, a great impact and helps Close the deal. Yeah, and uh, Jan, you were showing some of the light measurements. Is there a particular light measurement tool? Is it just a, a, a regular light meter you get on Amazon, or are these different? Are there different ones that with different capabilities that they should integrators should be thinking about? No, you can just use a regular one that's available on Amazon. There are very um, complicated ones, and people that are really into lighting can use those. But I don't use one at all. You just need to do the mock-ups that we've been talking about to train your eye to see the brightness relationships. And then you don't even need to use um, <clears throat> any um, measurements unless you're doing a commercial space, which you want lead for, um, then you want, then you have to have, to take the measurements. Yep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going here for a few other quick questions. I think this is a really good one. Jan, for you, about the do's and don'ts of LED lighting design, what to look for. I know, for example, you mentioned how you saw the texture in that one door, and you said, this is something I really want to highlight. Are there cues that an integrator or that a lighting designer looks for to know this is a focal point that I need to um, highlight versus something that's like, eh, don't worry about that? <laughs> Good question. So you want to just scope out the space with your eyes and see what's interesting, what's the visual destination, what's the most important thing, and then look at that element and see what about that element can you enhance. So for the door, it was that beautiful texture. For a tree, it might be the shape. For some um, plantings, or uh, it might be the color, or a sculpture, it might be the form or the color. So it's just a, mad, uh, a matter of using techniques. So when you want to show texture, you need to get the fixtures close to the object to show the texture, creating shadows. If you want to show an overall form, then you move the fixtures further away. But don't forget, no more than 35 degrees of aiming. Great. All right. You know, we have a few more questions and the questions we didn't get to here, folks, um, we are going to send all of these to Michelle. Michelle and her team can answer those directly. But I wanted to Thank again, Garden Light LED for sponsoring today's webcast. I want to thank uh, uh, Jan Moyer and I want to thank uh, Michelle Mueller for the presentation today. I, I learned a lot, a heck of a lot, and I hope you learned a lot too. And this will really kind of catapult your landscape lighting business in the future. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon and a thank you again for attending today. Bye. Bye. Thank you.